Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. That one was fine, wasn't it?
You're all very welcome to the service this evening at Port Anne Baptist. Um, if you all like to stand with us, we're going to sing Open the Eyes of My Heart. Well, good evening. Good to have you out with us here in Port Down Baptist this evening. Uh, as we look forward to this morning, so we do this evening again, that we might um, and be blessed of God as we worship him together uh, corporately this evening. Uh, again, you've seen the announcements uh, up on the screen uh, for the, the program, for the events uh, through the week. Uh, please do be familiar with those. You'll also get those on our website and on our social media pages. Uh, as I said, do be aware of those, be uh, informed of what's going on, uh, if it's applicable so that you can attend, if not, so that you can be praying for those different um, events uh, as they come up. And uh, do remember men, the uh, men's ministry outing uh, that was up on the screen. Um, spaces are limited. Um, I hope there are still spaces left because I haven't got my name down for it yet. So um, if the guys in the front can hear me, if there's one space left, I bags it. Um, but hopefully there's other spaces left. But men, um, if you're available on uh, 25th, then please do sign up for that. It'll be a good afternoon of fellowship together. Uh, Andrew is on part three of his four-part series uh, this Sunday evening, the series entitled, If You Want to Grow. Last couple of Sundays, we looked at um, our reading our Bible. And tonight and uh, next week, we are looking together at the uh, topic of how to pray. It might seem a very obvious thing to do, but then so was how to read our Bibles. And yet it's something I think if we're all honest with each other, uh, we struggle with um, and maybe misunderstand. So we will look at that this evening and again, God willing, next Sunday evening. Now, the one thing you don't get to do, and we're all familiar with this at home, but the one thing you don't get to do with a preacher in a pulpit on a Sunday is you, you don't get a remote control so you can't hit the pause button uh, and you can't hit the rewind. Now, you might get away with a pause button. I suppose if you stuck your hand up in the air, Andrew might figure it out and pause, but, but you don't get the kind of flick backwards and forwards. But remember, uh, we, we, we look forward to hearing it this evening, but remember that we do have it on a podcast and uh, the video will also be available on, on YouTube. So the opportunity is there for you to go back over and think, right, on Sunday night, I, I, I didn't quite get that, or maybe I, I missed that section, or I'd like to figure, think about that again. Use the podcast, um, or use the video, and, uh, and, and think about it again, and mull it over, um, and, and be, be more educated, more informed, 
and more blessed through what uh, we, we look at these Sunday evenings. There will be a, a Q&A, a question and answer session um, after Andrew finishes speaking. Um, feel free to ask a question. I haven't been here the last two Sundays, so I'm not quite sure how they went, but, but please do feel free to ask a question. Um, and if you weren't told this before, when it comes to questions, we're often very shy about asking questions. And, and often the reason for that is we think, well, because I'm the only person asked, who's going to ask that question because everybody else knows the answer to it. Well, the truth is that is very, very rarely ever the case. Very rarely are you the only one who has a, a question or something they're not sure about. Um, so, so feel free to, to ask this evening. And then just as I remind you this morning, hopefully you got one either this morning on your way in this evening, uh, our uh, Go Leaflet, um, giving the details of our young people that are heading out on different um, summer outreach and mission, short-term missions work. And please, if you haven't got one, make sure you get one before you leave this evening. Um, and uh, if you've got one, then please don't just tuck it away somewhere, but, but keep it uh, to the forefront and use it. Um, all the, the details of those that are going, the dates they're going, where they're going, are all on, on the leaflet. So please use that and be praying for our young people um, throughout the summer. It's a fantastic thing, as I said this morning. It's an incredible encouragement to them. It's an incredible encouragement to us as a church uh, that our young people have the desire and the opportunity to do this. And so we want to support them and encourage them. If you see any of the young people about, tell them you're praying for them, you're thinking of them. But please do, as the summer rolls on, um, be, be, be praying for the teams. Um, it already starts this week. Well, it's already started. Ryan is, is, is at least on his way back, if not back, from Senegal. Um, and this Friday coming, uh, the team go out to Philadelphia. And so Henry Capper and Rebecca, Bethany, and Naomi Irwin uh, will be um, heading out to Philadelphia and um, pray for the team from our church that are going out um, and for the rest of the team uh, that God will uh, protect them as they travel, that he will protect them physically from harm and that he will bless them as a team, them as individuals and uh, as a group. And we'll be praying for them uh, ourselves just in a moment or two, but please do be praying for the team as it heads out. Now, uh, the uh, praise team have already led us in an opening piece of, piece of praise, and we thank them for that. Uh, and we, we are going to sing again in just in a moment or two as we lift our voices in praise of God again. But before we do that, we're going to commit our time to him in prayer. So let's pray together. Father, again, as we... As we thank you this morning, so we thank you this evening again, for we thank you every time we do this, for the immense privilege and opportunity that is ours to gather in your presence and to know that you gather with us. Father, what a wonder that is, that you meet with us mere mortal created beings. What a blessing it is to us to know that we can enter into the very presence of God and that you through your Holy Spirit can engage with each one of us in this building this evening. Whatever our backgrounds, whatever, wherever we stand with you, whatever's been going on in our lives, however far down the Christian path of where Christians we've, we've been on, much or little of you we know, uh, our personalities, our temperaments, all the things that make us so different, yet you and your Holy Spirit can come and speak and work and deal with us individually. Father, we bless you for that. And we pray that as we corporately meet this evening, as we lift our voices in song, as we remind ourselves through these songs and through these hymns of who you are, uh, of, of, of what you do for us and what you mean to us, Father, we pray that we will be an encouragement to each other as we do that. And it will fill our hearts of that opportunity to praise and worship you. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for the teaching and the guidance and the help and the encouragement and the challenge, and yes, at times, the rebuke and the correction that comes from it. Father, we thank you that you have not left us to figure out this Christian life all by ourselves. You have not left us to, to imagine you, to guess who you are and what you're like. You have revealed so, so much of yourself to us in your word, and you have left us with your word as our guide, as, 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 our, as that that would, that would govern our lives and, and would would give us all that we need to live for you in this world. And Father, you tell us from your word that an important aspect for us is the aspect of prayer. And, and again, if we're honest with each other, we all struggle with it. 
We know we should do it. And, and we do it, but at times we wonder what we're actually doing. Is it making any difference? What, what exactly is happening? And so, Father, we pray that as we look at this topic tonight, and God willing, next Sunday night, we pray that you'll, that you'll help us to maybe refocus on something that we have lost some sight of. We pray, our Father, that you'll help us to understand afresh, maybe in ways that we just hadn't grappled with before, hadn't thought about before, the wonder and the uh, amazement um, that is uh, a prayer to you. Father, we thank you for the opportunities we have to, uh, to serve you, whether that's here in, uh, in the church, whether that's in our community, whether it's in our school, in our workplace, wherever it might be, we thank you for those opportunities. And we thank you for the opportunity that so many of our young people are, are, are making the most of through the summer months to go on short-term missions, to, to serve you, to, to witness for you, to share your gospel and your love in, in, in the wider community. Father, we thank you for every one of the names and the faces that we have on our Go Leaflet. We bless you for every one of them. We pray that you will be to them all that they need. Maybe some of them are doing this for the first time. Maybe they're full of nervousness, full of full of worry about, about how it'll go, how they will cope. Father, we pray that you will take away that anxiety, take away that worry, that nervousness. May they, over the, over the days that come, over the weeks before they head away, may they more and more know that you will be their strength, you will be their help, and you will be a blessing through them. Father, we pray for ourselves as a church. May we wrap our arms around these young people with encouragement, with support, with um, excitement and anticipation. Father, as they come back and report back, may we just rejoice with them over what you've been able to do among them. We pray particularly for the team leaving for Philadelphia on Friday. We pray for Henry and for Rebecca and for Bethany and for Naomi and for the rest of the team. Father, we pray that they will have that real sense of singleness of purpose, that, that oneness as a team. Pray, Father, for that as they go out for the plans that have been put in place by the, by the folks out in Philadelphia. We pray that you will be very definitely the center of what is done out there. Thank you, Father, for the many years the group have been going out from CE and from here to Philadelphia. Pray, our Father, that there will be a blessing this year as they have been before. Father, may they know your help, know your support, know your strength, and know your wisdom as they serve you. We think of the um, Port Anne College SU that's heading away for the weekend, next weekend, and, and for Bethany and the other teachers who will, who will be part of that team as well. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity they have to go away and, and spend some time in fellowship and in friendship and some time thinking about you and, and, and in a more focused way. And pray, Father, that you'll bless that weekend as well in your will. Father, you are so good to us. We have so much to thank you for, so much to praise you for. We bring these things to you knowing with confidence that we come to a God who is, is, is more excited about us, us serving you than, than even we are. And so, our Father, we ask that you'll hear and answer our prayers that we might have caused to rejoice in you and so that you might be brought honor and glory through what you do among us. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll hand over to the praise team. They're going to lead us in a couple of songs. And then after that, Andrew will come and read from God's word and minister to us. Thank you. I'd just like to stand with us as we sing. i 
song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you but Jesus you're my hope and stay so teach my song to rise to you temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you but Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord I need you oh I need you every Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you to Stephen, and thank you to the praise teams and the tech teams, the welcome teams. 
Everybody who's been involved in our services today, very much appreciated, really appreciate your ministry. Thank you for being here this evening for the um, latest of these practical studies. And if you want to grow some basic Christian disciplines, uh, some basic Christian um, attitudes of heart towards the Lord, we've been thinking about these together on Sunday nights. We spent, as Stephen said, um, two weeks looking together at how we can read um, our Bibles. Um, we're going to spend this evening and next Sunday evening looking at some methods, some strategies for developing our prayer life. Um, we'll study this together this evening, and then when we finish, when we close the service in, in prayer and the live stream concludes, then we'll move to a question and answer session. Let me encourage you to participate in that. It's been so good to hear from a number of you when we're looking at how to read our Bibles. Maybe as you're listening this evening, there'll be certain things that come to your mind. Not necessarily questions, maybe comments, maybe things that you've found helpful in your prayer life, um, things that have enriched um, your time with God. Please be prepared, if you would, to share those. Or something I say tonight might prompt thinking. Or you might want to ask something that we can pick up next Sunday evening when we look at this again. This evening, we're going to lay a biblical foundation. We are, if you like, going to look at principles for prayer this evening. And then next Sunday evening, we're going to look at the practice of prayer. So uh, what I'm going to share with you tonight is really just giving you some very simple pointers. Um, and then we'll look next week at some things you can tangibly do, either to begin in your prayer life, or to revive your prayer life, or to enrich and enhance it if you've already got healthy habits with regard to prayer. But we're going to read the Word of God. I'm going to invite you to turn with me in your Bible to Matthew's Gospel. Um, we're going to read together from Matthew chapter 6. It's going to be really valuable to you, um, not just to have uh, that open while I read it, but keep it open through the rest of our time. I do apologize for the very bright green PowerPoint slide. Um, I can see it I'm bathed in a green glow here, and hopefully uh, nobody's retinas are detaching while you're looking at it. Uh, but uh, Matthew chapter 6 is where, where you'll find a reading. I'm going to read from verse 1, and uh, we're going to read from there um, right down to the end of the section on the Lord's Prayer, um, down to verse 15. So Matthew chapter 6 uh, commencing to read at verse 1. Let's hear the word of God together. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be applauded by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. When you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them. Because your Father knows the things you need before you ask Him. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. Those are reading there at verse 15 of Matthew 6. Let me uh, invite and encourage you to keep that open in front of you. And let's bow together, please. And let's pray. A terrible thing if we're going to talk about prayer and not pray about prayer. So let's pray. Father, thank you for these opportunities that we have together on Sunday evenings just to refresh our minds about the basics of our Christian walk, our Christian discipline, our Christian devotion. Thank you, Lord, that you're so patient with us as we seek to walk with you. Thank you that you empower us by your Spirit to serve you in the ways that you command. And thank you that you instruct us in your Word very clearly about how we might approach you and how we might enjoy you 
and how we might commune and communicate with you. This evening, Lord, I pray that this study would be a real rich means of encouragement to everyone who listens, to my heart, to all our hearts. That, Lord, where our prayer lives are flagging or patchy or perhaps in honesty non-existent, that what we study together this evening might be inspiring, that it might enthuse us again about the blessing of prayer. Or, Lord, where our prayer times are regular but perhaps routine, I pray that you would quicken in us a, a, a true and new joy in coming to you in prayer. And Lord, where we have been walking well and thoroughly enjoying your presence, I pray that we would find affirmation in your word and enhancement for our time with you. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us this evening to fellowship with each other in these issues, to build each other up in prayerfulness, to, to take every opportunity to encourage each other through prayer and in prayer. And so as we consider these things now, Lord God, please help us. Help me to communicate effectively and directly and plainly. And help us to receive what your word says and the counsel from it with humble and submissive hearts. Lives that are ready to be molded by what you say. Bless us and help us, Lord God, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder, have you ever been afflicted by a mind worm? I wonder if you ever had something, a task or an upcoming event, perhaps even an ordeal. And try as you might, you can't dispel it from your head. You can't get it out of your mind. I wonder if some of you have a task that stubbornly lingers and haunts your to-do list, something you know needs done, but somehow you never find the time, or when you have the time, you don't get it done. Maybe when you look out in your back garden, there's a project that you know needs to be completed. Every time you see it, it stabs you a little in the heart, but you still don't seem to most of the time to get it done. For many of us, when it comes to prayer, we can feel like that as Christians. As those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior, we know that we ought to pray. We know that we should pray. We know that there would be tremendous benefit in prayer, but perhaps we don't know where to start. Or perhaps there is that inbuilt, inherent resistance simply to taking time to pray. Or maybe for you, the struggle is different. You, you pray regularly. You pray each day. You find rhythms and patterns that help you to remain regular in coming before the Lord. But you just wish that you could enrich your time with him a little more. Perhaps the way you've prayed over many years has become really just a ritual. And you'd love that God would breathe new spiritual life into seeking him. Well, these two Sunday nights are designed to address just those issues, to help us overcome some of the feelings we have about not praying or to help us to develop and see more blessing as we seek to serve the Lord and as we seek the Lord in prayer. And I've been hoping and trusting that if you're a new Christian, that this might give you a beginner's guide to understanding prayer. I used to work in a bookshop and we had a variety of texts in that bookshop. Some were very academic and others weren't. And sometimes a customer would come in and ask for a book, let's say a book on biology, and you had to do a little bit of psychology to work out, were they a lay person in that subject or an academic? And we had a row of books that had the title Biology for Dummies or Italian for Dummies, but you'd be very politic about whether you suggested that that was the book for them. Well, this is not prayer for dummies because there's no dummies among us, but this is prayer for beginners and prayer for continuers, and prayer for developers as we seek to know the Lord and commune with him. And so this evening, there's a few things that we are going to do. We're going to lay down some principles this evening from Matthew 6. What we've read there comes from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It is an integral part of a series of teachings that Jesus gave on one occasion that have come to be known as the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus here is laying down principles for his kingdom and for kingdom living, how our Christian lives are to be patterned as we follow him. And Jesus here in Matthew 6 gives us some very frank, some very challenging, and some very practical teaching about prayer. We're going to mine what Jesus says there. I think we're going to find it immediately accessible. We're going to find it immediately understandable. And I hope as well, we're going to find it ultimately applicable. 
Now, before we come to what Jesus says, let me tell you what I'm not going to do on these couple of Sunday evenings. I'm going to try to help you to avoid the guilt trap. Sometimes whenever we come to talk about prayer, what you'll receive from the pulpit or what you'll hear in your heart is just a burden of guilt. You'll feel in some way, well, I went to church on Sunday night and I heard that part of the Christian life is praying and now I just feel worse about it than I did. And as I begin to speak to you about prayer this evening, perhaps a series of resistances rise in your heart and your mind. I don't have enough time to pray. My life is really, really busy. I've got a very active social life or I've got a busy family life. My working life is hectic and I really struggle to find time. Or perhaps you would say, look, Andrew, I'm a bit nervous about talking about prayer because when it comes to prayer, I feel like I I don't have the right words to say. Whenever I get time to talk to God, I feel very ill-equipped to to speak to him. I don't know what sort of language I should use. I don't know what sort of approach I, I have. Or perhaps you find it really hard to focus. Ours is probably the most distracted generation that has ever lived. You ever watch people when they're in a coffee shop maybe sitting on their own or with someone else. And they've set themselves perhaps to have a conversation with the person they're with or to read their book, but they seldom do that in a linear way anymore because there's a bleep or there's a ding and the phone is lifted and things get broken up. You say, I find it really hard to focus. My mind is just so, so fragmented, both with the pressures of of new media and the pressures of life. Or perhaps it is you say, look, when it comes to prayer, I feel a little bit embarrassed because I feel illiterate when it comes to prayer. No one's ever taught me how to pray. And I hear other people pray and I hear their proficiency and how articulate they are and how comfortable they are in God's presence. And while it warms my heart to hear them, it leaves me cold when I come to seek God for myself. Let me say to you this evening, I don't intend to compound those feelings of grief and those feelings of guilt. I don't intend to make you feel bad, but to give you and I both steps that we can take to renew or begin in our prayer life. So let's do what Jesus does as he begins to teach his disciples here in Matthew 6 about prayer from verse 5. We're going to, first of all, clear the ground. We're going to try and think clearly about what not to do when it comes to prayer. And Jesus, in verses 5 to 8, gives a series of things that he tells his followers they should avoid when it comes to prayer. The first of those you can find um, in verses 5 through to verse 6. Where Jesus tells his disciples that when it comes to prayer, they are to avoid performative prayer. What is performative prayer? Performative prayer is being concerned to be seen. Now, Jesus is teaching his disciples here in a context. The context is that prayer had become professionalized in their society. The Pharisees and the scribes were the experts in prayer. Academically, they understood it, and publicly, they were its practitioners say prayer to someone in Jesus' day, and they'd immediately think of certain figures in their society who were very visibly and evidently prayer people. In actual fact, the Pharisees' prayer was completely performative. They did it, Jesus says here, to be seen by people, verse 5. And Jesus says to his followers, don't be like that. Don't think that prayer is a way to get some kind of kudos with other Christians or kudos with God to get some sort of status in the eyes of others or in his eyes. Now, there's all sorts of images used by Jesus here. He talks about the Pharisees standing on the street corners to be seen by people. Earlier on when he talked about them giving, he talked about them sounding a trumpet before them. Well, for us, performative prayer doesn't look like going out on the street corner of Thomas Street and Tavern Avenue and praying. But it can be trying to project that we pray more than we do. Perhaps projecting our prayer life on the social media. Or perhaps even saying to people that we're praying for them more than we ever actually do. Jesus says, listen, try to get your prayer life grounded into the private sphere. Forget about being performative. And he gives this very striking image. Now, Jesus is not banning public prayer, but in verse 6, he tries to redress the balances in a society. He says, when you pray, don't be like the Pharisees, don't be performative, but go into your private room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Jesus is encouraging his disciples to ground and earth all of their praying in the reality of their relationship with God and not with the perception of other people. 
Now that matters because it's a temptation for us, particularly when we get together with other people to pray, to project more than what we would say to God in private. But Jesus is saying the cultivation of private prayer is the heart of healthy prayer. Something else to avoid? Not just performative prayer, but also pagan prayer. If performative prayer is being concerned with being seen, then pagan prayer is being concerned with being heard. Now, that sounds really strange, doesn't it? Because you imagine when we talk about prayer that we should be concerned that we're heard. We want God to hear us when we pray. But look at what Jesus says in verse 7. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your Father knows the things you need before you ask him. And so in the pagan culture, away from the Pharisees and the scribes and the Jewish culture around Jesus and his disciples, in pagan culture, prayer was a kind of incantation. If the person praying could say the right words enough times and work themselves into a sufficient frenzy using prayer like a mantra, then somehow they might move the heart of a pagan god to be favorably disposed towards them and do what they ask. They were praying in order to be heard. They felt that their prayers in some way would add up to being worthy of an answer. Whenever I was a kid, there used to be uh, talent shows on TV. I think they were waning. I think they were in their, in their latter days, to be honest. But there was Opportunity Knox and a couple of others. And some of those shows would have had the audience decided who got through to the next round. Do you ever remember that? Some of you who are around the same age as me or some of you who are watching them when they're in their heyday. And they had this strange piece of technology on TV called the clapometer. Do you remember clapometers? I'm not on my own. This wasn't a bad dream I had. I think this actually happened. I think it was probably the most full kind of technology you can imagine because looking at the way entertainment looks now, probably the judges had decided who they wanted through. But what they would do was they'd invite the, the audience to clap and this would measure the decibel rate and they would have a series of acts they could clap for and whoever got the loudest clapping got through to the next round. Well, the pagans had that sort of idea about prayer. If they could just get sufficient noise before God, then somehow God would act. And Jesus says, avoid pagan prayer. Don't be concerned about being heard in that way. Why? Well, verse 8 says, because God's not like that. Your heavenly Father, your Father, knows the things you need before you ask him. So whenever we pray, we are not twisting God's arm. We are not doing what little children are so good at doing, which is sort of rhyming in the hope that they might bend the will of a parent to what they want. We're coming to a God who is disposed to hear us. We're coming to a God who, in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, has adopted us into his family and is our heavenly Father. And so in prayer, we don't need to be concerned about being heard because in Christ Jesus, we are already heard. The Father loves us. Now that very helpfully leads us in to the Lord's Prayer that's recorded uh, from verse 9 through to verse um, 14 or 15 of, of the chapter. And that's what we're going to look at now. It's not really, if you like, the Lord's Prayer. This is a prayer that the Lord gives to his disciples. Now, he teaches it proactively here in Matthew 6, but we have another record of this where the disciples ask Jesus how to pray, and he gives them the same answer. So for Jesus, what follows here is a pattern for regular prayer on the part of a disciple. Now, next Sunday evening, we're going to look really practically at how you might pattern your prayers, how you might put structure in place that can help. But tonight, I just want to give you three key words about prayer that come from this passage. And I hope what they'll do is they'll lift the lid on what prayer really is. Here's what the three words are. Connection, adoration, and provision. Now, I think with those three words, we can summarize what Jesus says here. We can, we can extrapolate or draw out what he wants to communicate, and then we can bring it home to our own hearts. And this will lay a foundation for all our further consideration about prayer. So let's think about connection, first of all. Jesus says, verse 9, Therefore you should pray like this, Our Father in heaven. Now, there's something really interesting about this prayer pattern that Jesus gives to his followers here in Matthew 6. Here's what's interesting. 
some of the words, some of the pattern that Jesus provides was common to other traditions outside of Jesus in his day. And so there was a prayer pattern that was in existence and in circulation contemporary with Jesus called the Kaddish. And it used some similar phrasing to what we have here, particularly about honoring God's name and his kingdom coming. And Jesus, in a sense, when he talks about your name be honored, your kingdom come, is, is using terms that would have been familiar to a society. But what didn't appear in the Kaddish was this, our Father in heaven. In many ways, this is controversial language. Jewish people, of course, were familiar with the idea of God as Father. That's in the Old Testament. Not prominently, but it's there. You can think of Psalm 103, <clears throat> as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those um, who trust in him. He knows their frame and he remembers that they're dust. Jesus here is going a step beyond that. He is saying to these disciples that their prayer lives are in existence because God is their father. Look what Jesus says in verse 8. Your father knows the things you need. And then when you come to pray, you're to pray our father. So our prayer lives are not the cause of our relationship with God. But our relationship with God is the cause of our prayer life. We have a connection with God. We have a relationship with God if we've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, that might seem extraordinarily basic. You say, I've come to a service to learn about how to pray, and you're telling me what I already know. But we can't hear this enough. It means that when we pray, we are praying on the basis of intimacy with God. That means that prayer <clears throat> is enjoying communion with God. Jesus doesn't say to his followers, when you, when you come to God, honor him and ask him. And merely do that. Jesus says, honor him, ask him but enjoy him. You're coming to a God who is your father. I wonder if you ever entertained people in your home that you've never met before. You ever done that? So perhaps um, someone's passing through town and you've offered them that you can give them their dinner before they go on to their next place. Or perhaps there's a visiting speaker who comes to the church and you are um, entertaining them, giving them hospitality for the day. That can be a really enriching experience, can't it? But it can also be pretty nerve-wracking. It's quite a thing if you don't know someone to bring them into your home and in, at your table for three or four hours. And so when you're preparing, you're not just getting the dishes ready, but you're, you're thinking about how the conversation might flow. What kind of person will this be? Will we find things in common? Will we be able to, to talk freely? Or will it be staid and, and stiff and difficult? Contrast that with the prospect of meeting a very good friend whom you hold in high esteem, with whom you've had a great relationship for many years, and you're going to have a coffee with them tomorrow morning, and you haven't caught up in a little while. That feels totally different, doesn't it? The prospect of having someone you don't know whom you're trying to forge a relationship with and someone you do know that you enjoy a relationship with is night and day. Now, when it comes to prayer, God is not the stranger coming to our table whom we need to get to know each time. He is our Father, which means we come to him with that sense of relief and release. God invites us to be more ourselves with him than we can be with anyone else. The Bible scholar and teacher, the late Dallas Willard, said this, kingdom praying and its efficacy is entirely a matter of the innermost hearts being totally open and honest before God. It is a matter of what we are saying with our whole being, moving with resolute intent and clarity of mind into the flow of God's action. In apprenticeship to Jesus, this is one of the most important things we learn how to do. He teaches us how to be in prayer, what we are in life, and how to be in life, what we are in prayer. So our prayer 
is expressive of our relationship. You can truly be yourself when you come and talk with God. Do you find that a relief? Is that a help to know that you can relate to God in that way? He, he loves you. This is, this is Father's Day, and I'm reminding you that your prayer life is on the basis of God's fatherly love and care for you. He has accepted you in his son. And he longs for you to enjoy him and to be with him and to share with him. Being with those who love us means we can be with them at our best and we can be with them at our worst. If you've got very close friends here this evening or close family members, you'll know that they know you like no one else. They know what you're like at 6.30 in the morning when you've got to leave for work in an hour. They know what you're like when the DIY project goes south or when something burns in the pan or when you're late or when someone in the house is fractious with you and you get fractious back. They, they know all about you. If they ever decided to blackmail you, you're done for because you'll never be able to pay the ransom. God doesn't want us to come and perform to him. He wants us to come and commune with him. I think it took me a long time in my Christian life to really grasp the intimacy that there is with God in prayer. That I don't have to find the right words. I can come and be before him. And he knows me. And he loves me. He knows you. And he loves you. So you have a connection with God. And Jesus in this prayer says, start your prayer that way. Remind yourself in God's presence that he is your father. And that changes everything. Not only is there connection, but there's also adoration. Our father, Jesus says, is the pattern of how we pray, but it's our father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Now, I'm about to use two big words, but don't fear, because um, I've spent enough time trying to work out what they mean for myself in the hope that I might explain them to you. This prayer tells us that God is imminent and he is transcendent. Now, what does imminent mean? It means that God is, is with us. He's close to us. What does transcendent mean? It means he's not entirely like us. And so this prayer instructs us that we're to come to God in family terms, our Father, he is close to us. He, he loves us. He, he longs to fellowship with us. He's imminent. But the pattern that Jesus gives for prayer tells us also that God is transcendent. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. And so our prayer lives, of course, come into God's presence, acknowledging that we belong to him and he loves us and he cares for us and he wants to nurture us and he loves it when we come and, and seek his face. But prayer also brings us to a place where we remind ourselves that God is great. By great, I don't mean outstanding. He is outstanding, but I mean he is great in magnitude. He is God in heaven. And our prayer lives are designed to honor him. Our prayer lives are designed to, to, to hallow his name, as the King James language says, to, to remind ourselves that he's holy. What does it mean that he's holy? We've got some of the wrong ideas around holy in our minds, don't we? But it means he's set apart. He's distinctive. He's, he's different. He's, he's someone of a completely different order than anyone else. He's the only one who deserves praise and worship. So Jesus says, when you pray... Remember your connection. Our Father, that, that's the, the seed, the, the, the foundation of everything. But remember adoration. You can come to God and extol him for who he is. And so our prayer lives mean that we meditate on the person of God. That we remind ourselves that we're coming to this wonderful God, this, this glorious God, this holy God. But how do you do that? Well, we'll think about that in more detail next Sunday evening in terms of how we remind ourselves of God's greatness. But a very simple principle is that God has given us an entire book about himself. And we can take some of the truths from Scripture, particularly the Psalms, and import them into our prayers to remind ourselves that, yes, this is our Father, but he's great and he's lifted up. 
and he's glorious. And so the pattern that Jesus gives for prayer here reminds us of our connection. It reminds us to keep adoration in view, honoring him as holy. But it also reminds us that prayer is about provision. I wonder, are you a very dependent person or a very independent person? I think in Northern Ireland, we tend to be fairly independent. Maybe you're one of those people who struggles to ask for help. I can understand that. But Jesus says in this prayer that we are to come to God and we are to ask him for help. It's a major part of what prayer is. We're not supposed to be embarrassed about that. Sometimes we say prayer is more than asking for things. Of course it is. We've talked about adoration and our connection with God. We'll think next week about some of the other components of prayer. But prayer is also asking. And a huge amount of this pattern for prayer that Jesus gives is preoccupied with asking. We could summarize it as give us, forgive us, and deliver us. So what sort of things when we come to God should we ask for? Well, here's the first thing. Put the kingdom on your wish list. Do you have a wish list anywhere? Maybe on Amazon? Wish lists are really revealing, aren't they, about the things we really want. I have family members who have wish lists, and I've discovered that they've got interests and hobbies that I never knew anything about because they've stuck stuff on there that I didn't know. Sometimes my wish lists get a bit mixed up with family wish lists. So when the children were younger, it looked like I had a, a, an incredible interest in Duplo and Lego because uh, some of their items got imported onto mine. But I wonder what your wish list is when you come in prayer. Well, Jesus says, put the kingdom on your wish list. Get preoccupied with the idea that God's rule and God's kingdom and God's righteousness and God's power should become ever more evident on earth. So Jesus says, when you pray, pray your kingdom come. What does that mean? It means God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. It means that God will finally and fully deliver the kingdom that Jesus began, that, that God will, will bring into existence through the return of his son a kingdom that will never end. And in the interim, we should be praying that God's kingdom would be extended and built up and developed. So Jesus says, make that part of your prayer life. Put the kingdom on your, prayer, on your wish list. So when you pray, you come in connection to God, your Father, you come in adoration of him, and you come asking him to do his work in the world for his glory. So a major part of our prayer lives should be praying that others would know the privilege that we have of enjoying God as our Father. That can be personally. Lord, let your kingdom, please, let your kingdom come in the life of my, my wife or, or my husband or my children or my parents or my brothers and sisters. Let your kingdom come in the life of my wider family that they might become part of your kingdom and trust in you. Let your kingdom come with these Precious neighbors who live around me, who perhaps know me well or whom we don't know at all. Lord, let your kingdom come in this street and, and, and in this district of Portadown and in this town and, and on this island and in this province and in this nation and in this world. Jesus says, make that a part of your prayer life. Part of what your prayer life is doing is being used by God as an instrument to see world and local mission achieved. Put the kingdom on your wish list. Come and ask God to do his work. What part do you and I play in seeing God's kingdom established? Well, this prayer tells me that all of us pray, play a crucial role. The smallest child in this church who knows how to ask God to make his kingdom come can be a key player in seeing the world changed. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> so looking at some of the little ones who are here this evening. Fantastic that they're here. And amazing that if they, they know the Lord Jesus as their Savior in their young life and they're in, in worship with their family at home and they're taught to pray that God's kingdom would come, God delights to take that little prayer and do great things through it. Imagine that, that tomorrow on, on your commute to work, when you're driving in the car, and you're saying, Lord, I want your kingdom to come on these streets. My assumption being you've still got your eyes open while you're driving, but I want you to bring your kingdom here, to, to this area. Imagine the fact that God has ordained that that's part of how exactly how he'll do that. Put the kingdom on your wish list. That's a great motive to prayer. 
What else can we ask for in terms of provision? Well, here's the thing. Bring your brokenness and share his forgiveness. Verse 12, Jesus says, make a major part of your prayer life, asking for God to cleanse you and forgive you. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us for the ways in which we've erred. And Lord, please, verse 13, help me to avoid temptation to sin again. Not only forgive me what's past, but direct my paths not to go the same way again or to go in different ways against your will. And so part of our prayer life is coming before the Lord and telling him where we've failed. Failure can be a terrible barrier to prayer. I don't think I've told you this story. If I have, please just pretend like I haven't. Um, but when I was around 10 years of age, I do have a suspicion I've told you this, but I'll confess it again. When I was around 10 years of age, I discovered in the phone book, um, and this is such a bizarre thing to do as a child, but I discovered, you know, the big, thick BT phone books, I discovered that there was one phone number for the Vatican City. I was intrigued. There was one phone number for the exchange in the Vatican City. And I was inquisitive. And we had a phone in the house. And nobody was home. So I rang the Vatican. I did it three times because they spoke in Italian and I didn't know what they were saying. I didn't get an audience with anyone eminent, in case you're wondering. Then I read the small print in the phone book. <coughs> and it said what the calls were charged at. It was enormous. Phone bills came every three months, every quarter. I had it at the wrong time. It was the start of the quarter. I had three months of agony waiting for the bill to arrive. I'm wondering as a 10 year old how I was going to explain that I'd called the Vatican. So I devised myself a plan, in the words of Johnny Cash, that would lead to the envy of most any man. I decided that when the bill arrived, I would put some money in the drawer with the bill. Call it, if you like, the Vatican Fund. So when my father opened the phone bill, he would be outraged, and then his anger would be assuaged. And so that's what I did. The thing that I didn't account for was my dad found it hilariously funny that I'd rung the Vatican City. And they told me that they'd known for months I was tense about something. They'd had my parent-teacher interview <clears throat> and expected that I'd been misbehaving in school because I was so tense around the house. But what I did was I, I tried to, to avoid the issue, I worried about the issue, and then I tried to some way compensate the issue because I believed that in some way this could create a disjunction between me and the family that I loved. And that's exactly what we do when we feel. We do something extraordinarily foolish as a Christian, the equivalent of ringing the Vatican. And we are ashamed and we are embarrassed, and we are anxious. And here's what we think. We think either if we don't come to God in prayer, he won't know about it, or that we should work up some capital before we come to him and pray. So we'll give it a few weeks of serving in church. We'll give a little more into the offering, or we'll ramp up our Bible reading, or we'll buy a few more Christian books, or listen to a few more podcasts until the, the shame of our sin settles down. That's not what Jesus tells us to do. Bring your brother brokenness and see that that is not an obstacle to prayer but a gateway to prayer father forgive me can i share something with you much more serious than my my brief career in international telesales i have to ask god to forgive me my sin every single day morning and evening and do you know the joy? There's such relief in doing it. Forgive me my sins. 
And then on the basis of that, share your forgiveness. Jesus says, if you're forgiven, then you'll forgive other people. If you come through that process of letting the Lord down and feeling anxious and upset and then unburdening your heart and asking for his free forgiveness, that patterns for you how you'll treat those who wrong you. And of course, there's so much in there pastorally that we'll not unpack. But also, Jesus says to his followers in terms of provision, ask simply and ask persistently. Verse 11, Jesus says, part of our prayers is, give us today our daily bread. Now, if you look at the history of interpretation of Matthew 6, verse 11, it's really quite amusing because Bible scholars and um, some of the church fathers from the earliest days of the Christian church said Jesus could not possibly have simply told his followers that in their prayers they were to ask for bread. So this must mean something else. And so a whole complex of ideas was built up that what Jesus was saying here was that his followers should ask for spiritual bread to be spiritually sustained. Jesus is telling his followers that they should pray for the things that they need every single day. But God is concerned literally with bread and butter issues. And that God wants us to come in reliance on him and unburden ourselves about the things that we're concerned about that we need. There's a book by Pete Gregg called How to Pray. I can't fully recommend the book to you because there's elements of it that I wouldn't fully agree with, but it's a wonderful book in many ways. And this is what he says. Our primary privilege as God's children is to ask audaciously and repeatedly for everything we need, expecting him to answer naturally or supernaturally. So let me ask you something, a little thought experiment. What are you worried about? What are you worried about? Some of you are so laid back, you're not worried about anything. Please just bear with the rest of us for a moment or two. What are you worried about? Think about that. What's the chief source of stress for you as a Christian? What's the thing that would either wake you up or keep you up? Jesus says we're to come with those needs. Seek him. Talk to God. At a period in our history when inflation's on the rise, when the cost of living is so steep, when job security and wage security is at an all-time low, we can come and say, God, please give me my daily bread. That's okay. God wants you to talk to him about these things. So ask simply. But when Jesus says here that we're to ask for our daily bread, that's not so we get a lifetime supply Tim Horton's just down the corner here. It's about to open, I think. I don't think it's opened yet. The first person to get into Tim Horton's when it opens gets a free amount of coffee for a year. It's worth about 3,810 pounds. I've done my research. I'm ready. It'd be lovely to know that if you're gliding by Tim Hortons, you can just go in as the person who's been given the keys of the kingdom and get yourself a quick Americano on the house and swagger out, knowing that you can come back in tomorrow and get the same thing. We don't come to God and say, Lord, give me what I need for the next 30, 40 years, stack it up in a pension fund so it's on the tab, day and daily. Lord, give me what I need. Give me my bread today and tomorrow. Lord, give me my bread Day. That's exactly how God fed his people in the wilderness, with just enough manna to do them on a certain day and then to come the next morning. And so God's delighted when we ask him, and he's delighted when we ask him persistently. And maybe your needs are complex, and maybe you've prayed about them and they're not coming to pass. God wants us to keep asking. Again, let me give you a quote from Pete Gregg. God's suddenly happen slowly. Most instant miracles take years. Quite often what arrives quickly in terms of something that we've been burdened about and troubled about and we see God's answer, it looks like it's sudden, a resolution, but it comes as the fruit of perhaps years of asking the Lord to provide. 
And so this pattern prayer of Jesus gives us some principles about prayer. Connection. We remember that we're in an intimate relationship with God. Adoration. We remember who God is. And provision. We remember that God wants us to ask him for his kingdom to come, to ask him for forgiveness for our sins, and to ask him to provide our most basic needs. Doesn't that give us a bit of an on-ramp in the prayer? It's profoundly simple and profoundly beneficial to be ourselves before God bring our needs before God, to bring our sins before God, to bring his kingdom before him, and to ask him to move and to answer. Those are the principles. And that provides a foundation for us then next week to look at the practices of prayer. How do you actually do this then? What, what will you put in place to give you good and healthy rhythms for prayer? But perhaps this week you would just take those three words, connection, adoration, provision, Talk to God about those. Perhaps pick up Matthew 6 and read it as a prayer to God. Fill in the gaps of the areas of your need and your sin and your hopes and your joys and your relationship with God. And find here a reconnection with the Lord as we seek him in prayer. May God bless his word to our hearts. Amen. Amen. Well, the praise team are going to lead us in another piece, a piece about prayer. We'll stand to sing that. And then after that song, I will pray. And then I'll come down to the little um, music stand um, and uh, we'll have our question and answers. If you've been with us on the live stream tonight, thank you for joining us and trust that you know the Lord's blessing. In the incoming week, the live stream will conclude just as I've closed in prayer. So I'll invite you to stand and we'll sing together. Father, we bless you and we praise you for the privilege of prayer. We thank you for the grace of the Lord Jesus to teach us so simply, to give us a pattern which is so helpful for seeking your face. Please help us to take this into our devotional lives, Lord, to remember the connection that we have with you as our Heavenly Father, 
to adore you in the glory of your name, to trust and rely on you for our every provision. Lord, help us to bring these things to you day and daily in this incoming week and to know the joy of approaching you and enjoying you and communing with you. Thank you for your presence with us, Lord. Thank you for those who have joined us on the live stream throughout today. Bless them, Lord, in this incoming week. And bless us as we take some time now just to share, um, think, to ask and answer questions. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.